Greetings. Welcome to the DragonCon Urban Fantasy Track author interview series. And I am joined this evening by the wonderful friend of the longtime friend of the track, Delilah Dawson. Hey, Carol. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it's been a while. And I thought, well, you know what? I need to catch up. Uh, we, we need to catch up on the several books that you have released since we last spoke uh, here in this setting. A thousand uh, years ago in the before four times. That's right. Well, it was actually partway through the, the times, but yeah, um, it was in December of 2020. I think your interview that I did was the second one. In oh yeah, that was pretty, that was early on too. Yeah. Like so, Jim Butcher, I think was first and then me, something yeah, like that. Yeah. So, uh, yes, so I, I wanted to make sure and do that. And I do want to warn our viewers that the beginning of this interview will be, you know, about some of your other works that have been out for a while, but that we will be discussing in depth your newest book, The Violence, which I just happened to have my well, one of my copies here, right here. So, yeah. Oh, you've got yours. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so we will be talking about that in depth. So if people have not read it, uh, they may wish to, uh, you know, pause the interview or turn off the interview at that point. If they have not read it and they would like to, or if they have not finished it yet. Uh, it was kind of what happened to me the other night when I was watching your your interview with uh, Stephen Graham Jones was because I thought, oh, I hope they don't go too far because I, I had like, you know, I don't know, it was something like a third, maybe a third to a quarter of the book left. I was like, no, no, I don't want to hear too much. <laughs> so, but but we will be doing that tonight. So for folks who have not gotten to that point yet, um, this is this is your warning. Now, what well, I, so this I, is your pre-warning. You can listen right now. That's right, right. I will give you another warning before we begin discussing the violence. And I do hope that everybody will, you know, come back and, uh, you know, listen to it if they haven't read the book, because here is my, uh, my take on it. You need to read the dang book. I'm serious. So if you haven't read it yet, you need to, and then come back and watch the, the second part of the interview. I like it. I'll take but, it. Yeah. And, then, and my, uh, my first thing that I want to talk about here is Wellington. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, that came out right after I spoke to you the last time in one of these interviews. And I actually got it for Christmas that same year from a friend, which was great. And so I was just curious, uh, you know, how that all came about. I mean, and, you know, how, how did you first get involved in it? And where did the idea come from and all of that? Well, I'm super fortunate to... Uh right for Del Rey right now. All of my books that are coming out are pretty much Penguin Random House and the Del Rey section, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some kids books with Delacorte, but most of it's Del Rey. Um, and they do a great job when there's not a pandemic of bringing their authors to conferences, getting us on panels, doing book signings. And so whenever that happens, you have like this little cabal of writers that you're kind of with. And we have dinners together and panels together and we're all in the same hotel at the same bar. So we kind of form these little, these little con, uh, con clutches like we just get to be really good friends and so one year one of those people was Aaron Mankey who is the creator of Lore and just so many podcasts he is like the podcast mm -hmm. mafia king now super nice guy um so we got to spend a lot of time together and have you know dinners with Del Rey and we would all eat breakfast together and hang out at the bar so we got to know each other and then we got to go to some other conferences and so at one conference um I was supposed to get a shuttle to the conference hotel and the shuttle was running like three hours behind and I was like dying and I think I typed on Twitter, like, hello, the shuttle is three hours late. I'm dying. And Aaron was like, oh, I'm downstairs getting a limo. Do you just want to come with me? And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, I I'm downstairs know. in the airport with all my stuff, run and, you know, find him, get to go in his, you know, black town car or whatever it was. And we're on our way, you know, to this conference. And he was like, hey, can I run something by you? I had this idea for a comic and I don't know if it would work. And of course, I've listened to the lore podcast. And so, and I'd, I was writing a ton of comics at the time. So it's like, yeah, sure. Hit me. And so he's like, okay, what do you know about the Duke of Wellington? And I'm like, actually, I've used him in a comic. Like, I love the Duke of Wellington. He's like, really? 
<laughs> uh, like, like, my comic, my creator own comic Sparrowhawk came from uh, a quote from Wellington when the Queen of England got sick of seeing sparrows in the uh, the great glass um, observatory of the World's Fair. And she went to a Wellington and was like, what do I do about these sparrows? And he was like, get some sparrow hawks. And so they released sparrow hawks in there and they're just like dive bombing and killing the sparrows. I loved it. So yeah, so we got to talking about that and then we were both writing with, uh, both working with IDW and it was just, it all worked out just fine. Well, it's great. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, a lot of fun. I mean, it's got something for everyone. I think it's uh, spooky enough. It's funny enough. People who are into uh, history would probably enjoy it as well, as long as they don't mind, you know, having those those fun elements uh, added like in. If you like lore and you, you kind of like the sort of things that lore delves into, it's kind of expanding on a concept from that of the, the bar guest, the great black dog, and then Wellington as a monster hunter is how Aaron reimagined him. Yeah, now I, apparently I, when Jack the Ripper showed up, Wellington like got on his horse and was like, I'm going to go kill him. Yeah, right. <laughs> See you later. Or the, and that was a, that was something else I was wondering. Are there any possible is there any possibility of a follow up to that one? I don't know. Um, I haven't I haven't heard much like the, the comic didn't you know, normally that happens when a comic sells so well that it sells out and they have to get more. Um, I, I don't think this comic got that kind of attention, but it also like hit right, you know, instead of us getting to go basically promote it, we got right. to sign a an ash can, you know, a six piece ash can um, with Joe Hill. And then by the time it came out, you know, COVID was kind of happening. So we never actually really got to be out there promoting it together. Yeah. Oh, well, well, I'll keep my fingers crossed that, you know, something like that that, that may occur. But I, I do have a question about, um, you know, kind of graphic novels in general. Is it how how does that process generally work? Does when when you're actually putting things together, do it, it does the writing happen first or do the you know, does the art happen first or it does it just depend on whether it's a, you know, from publisher to publisher or maybe whether it's for children or whether it's for yeah, teens and adults, whatever. The production process is, is pretty similar, which is that, um, you know, the, if you're working, okay. So if you're working with a traditional comics publisher, typically you as the writer um, or possibly a writer artist team, if you're fortunate enough to have an ideas together, you write up a pitch and you go to your editor or your publisher and you say, we would like to make this comic book. Um, and it includes, you know, the characters, the outline, the comp titles, the kind of overall feeling of it. Um, and, you know, if they if they like the pitch, um, you know, sometimes they want to massage it or change it. But if they like it, then they say, OK, we'll give you, you know, four or five issues is very typical for comics. Mm -hmm. If you like me or a writer who doesn't do the art um, and, and who, you know, may not know a whole bunch of artists, they will match you up with an artist that they're comfortable working with and that they know can hit the deadlines. Um, because that's the big thing about comics is for the writer, for the, for the artist who does all the heavy lifting, like they do all the hard work. They have to do a lot of work in a quick amount of time. So they need kind of established people with a good reputation and an open space, um, in their schedule. And then, um, for each, uh, each issue, I write the issue. I send it to my editor. We go back and forth till we're happy with it. Then we send it to, uh, the artist. The first thing they have to do is develop the characters. So, um, you know, the, the writers involved in that where I describe the character and then they send them over and then I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. But, you know, could we maybe tweak this a little bit um, until oh. everybody's happy and then they, they take the script and go. And um, I've learned over the years to put a lot of faith in the artist. I think that my first couple of scripts were probably real wordy um, and maybe too specific. And as I gained comfort in trusting the, the artist, I just kind of let them loose and and they always did much better things than I would have done if I had like tightly controlled the art direction. Oh, okay. Well, that, and I, I get that. That makes a lot of sense in terms of what, you know, let with them letting the art express. Yeah. So they do the pencils, which is like the drawings. And then uh, they usually send those to the writer to double check that it, you know, works. And then I've, what they've done has hit what I've described. And then when that's correct, they send it to the inker who does the, the ink on it and then the colorist who does the color and then it goes to the um uh shoot that's, i'm so out of practice with comics i haven't written any in a while um the person who does the words <laughs> the yeah. the letterer 
the letter. Oh, okay. Right. Gotcha. Uh, Jim, Jim Campbell's going to come after me for getting that. But yeah, so the letter comes in and does all the letters, which is in itself an art form. So each of these people has like a very specific skill set. Sometimes the artist does everything. Sometimes it's, you know, separate pencils, inker, colors. And then the letter is generally a different person. But yeah, hold a whole bunch of layers. And it requires like lots of times the writer will be like, hey, can you check pages 14 to 17? And man, I've never gotten as many emails as when I was doing comics. <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, if you've got that many people, um, that <clears throat> that's interesting. And that must be kind of a different experience for someone who is used to pretty much doing your own thing and maybe only having to deal with a handful of other people while you're doing it, right? <laughs> That's kind of one of the reasons why I've moved out of comics and, and back into novels. I really like the way that you sink into a novel. It's almost like sinking into a jacuzzi where you're just kind of simmering in this for a long time, whereas uh, comics can can find to feel like getting hit randomly with a fire hose. <laughs> I'd rather sink into the water and be left alone to sink in the water. They'd be like, hey, splat! Hey, splat! Yeah, yeah, I... I... I can imagine, and especially when you're not expecting it, or if they would all come at the same time, right? And you're it's like, just wait. hard to have a complete thought, you know? Um, I guess when you're writing a novel, you're carrying that whole world in your head, every character, every thought, every backstory, every outfit. And when you get an email every 45 minutes, it can be very disruptive to that process. So yeah, oh, the, the year that I did almost all comics, I did not write or pitch books, which is why I didn't have a book out in 2020. Okay, well, that explains it. <laughs> but I'm making up for it now. That, that's right. I, I, you sure have. I mean, my gosh. Uh, well, yeah. When we talk about some of the other things that are coming, but I do want to, I do want to talk about mine. Yay, we'll mine. Of the, and uh, this book just this week was, uh, or was it this week or last week? I think. Oh, it was did it maybe also list? Yeah, and yeah, that it got. Uh, uh, recommended by Yalsa, which is the the young adult uh, division of the American Library Association. So that that's a big deal to end up cool. on that on their reluctant readers list. Yeah. So the and that's awesome because I will say that this book does contain something for everyone. <laughs> if I you mean, like being scared, it's gotcha. Exactly, and it doesn't. Um, you know. It, it's it's fun to read as an adult too. I mean, it, uh, it's I, I think you managed to to hit that sweet spot just right, so that you're not, you know, that it that it, it can still be appreciated by the younger set. And uh, when I was eleven, when I was ten or eleven, I was reading like Pet Cemetery and It. So I, I definitely <laughs> I, I I write I write horror for kids who were where I was. Right. Okay. Well, and it also uh, makes me quite sure that the next time that you're at Dragon Con, you'll definitely have to be on my ghost panel. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm down with the ghost now. I'm also, yeah. I'm working on right now a feminist horror book. I think it'll be out in 2023, maybe, or 2024, but more horror coming. Oh, good, good. Okay. Okay. Well, what if you, if you were going to give people like a, an elevator pitch on mine, what would you, what would you tell people that it's about? Um an eighth grade drama queen moves to a hoarder house in florida and discovers that there is more than just a bunch of junk but also a ghost yes that uh that's that's great when you 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 call her that that's that's perfect um now some uh, something that uh my 12 year old grandson is very excited about is your minecraft books well you, yep. you've got one that came out Back in what September, I believe. Um, wasn't yeah, September twenty eighth, I believe. My mind is a sieve. Like once a book is out, I don't remember anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't, I can't hold up a copy of that because he right. really has it's, it in his house. So. There, it's, it's right, right. It, it, oh my God, this thing is so backwards. It's right. It's over. It's oh this, okay. Uh, I can't. I'm gonna like turn a back muscle. Anyway, if you like Minecraft, it's a Minecraft book. Yes, he was very but, excited. But it's written, so like when I write a Star Wars book, I write it so that you don't have to have read every canon book to understand it. If it's your very first Star Wars book, as long as you've seen the movies, it'll make sense. And my Minecraft books are like that too. If you if you or your kid doesn't play Minecraft or doesn't know every single intricate part, it is still like an adventure story just in that world. So it's not like a, it's, a, it's an open door, not a gate. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Well, and yeah, that's, I, I think that's important too, because it's a way that, you know, people, 
it, 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 you can be familiar with the concept of something, but then, oh, there we go. Okay. There we go. So yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and there's a new one coming out in a couple of weeks, right? So yeah. And May 1st, it's called never say nether. And it's a, uh, this is the first Minecraft trilogy. Like they've had a bunch of independent books that have come out, but this one is a, a trilogy that follows the same friend group. It was kind of inspired by those, those eighties kids movies where the kids go off and have an adventure like monster squad or stand by me. Um, or the way that we see stranger things where it's like, mm -hmm. once you get away from the adults, you get to have the real adventure. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And the, yeah. In Stranger Things. Uh, interesting. Yes. Well, and that's, that's great that you can make that kind of connection between, you know, the things that people are familiar with in terms of, okay, I know what Minecraft is, but also I know what you're, you know, what, as you were saying, this whole, trilogy of the feeling of, of those kinds of, uh, of those kinds of stories. I think that is popular. You guys should use that as part of your tagline, something you like stranger things. Well, uh, you know, now, um, and you, in addition to the, uh, upcoming second part of the Minecraft, you also have another book coming out later in the summer, I think it's at the very end of the summer, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Camp Scare, is that correct? Scare. And what can you tell us about that one? Um, it is it is uh, my next middle grade horror after mine. Um, Camp Scare is about a, uh, a, a kind of like a, a school pariah who goes to summer camp hoping to reinvent herself and make friends. And instead she uh, becomes the pariah there and finds a ghost. Of course, it's got to be a ghost. Yes. If it's called Camp Scare, what yeah. what else could it be? Yes. Yeah, but no. When I was when I was in fifth grade, I went to one week of sleepaway camp, and it was completely cursed and wretched and horrible, and it was so bad that it inspired this book. Oh, okay. Well, I guess if so, you're you're uh, kind of exorcising your past in a in a way. I guess we could say, right? Well, you know, it's more of a case of um, <laughs> I. I was a kid who didn't really know how to make friends. I felt like there was, you know, everybody else had some secret that I didn't know. Like they had all paired up by the time I'd figured out I was supposed to find a friend and I was kind of lonely. Um, and when I went to summer camp, it was this girl who I kind of thought of as my best friend who was like, oh, I'm going to summer camp. And I was like, that sounds so cool. Where are you going? And she told me. And I was like, can I go? And she was like, well, I mean, it's it's a summer camp. You know, it's, it's a sleepover camp. Anybody can go. So I had my parents like arrange it because, you know, back then it's, we're not all connected. So they signed right. me up and they drove me out there. And it turned out that she goes there every year with her Girl Scout troop from her old city that she used to live in. And it was like me and this tightly knit bond of girls who'd been together since they were four. Um, and she, I just, I couldn't get in. There was no way to have a friend. So it was like this super lonely, pathetic <laughs> week of me being like, well, <laughs> And fifth grade is pretty much the worst yeah. to be to be going through. Oh, I was so like awkward. I looked like a potato with a toupee. It was a bad year. <laughs> oh yeah, a potato with a toupee. <laughs> and like uh, I wanted to go ride horses, but you had to sign up for that early, and my parents didn't sign up for it or pay for it. So like my whole camp, my whole you know cabin went to ride horses, and I like had to go like sit in you know the craft cabin like by myself. It was just everything about it was oh. terrible. So this this book is kind of dedicated to those kids who like. Hey, if you're a kid who's been told you're a little too much, if you are a kid who doesn't know how to make friends, if you're a kid who, you know, the teachers probably like you better than the other kids, like you're not alone. Right. <laughs> right there. You're like, I am, I am proof positive that this happened. There's hope. Yeah. Now, uh, given how, given your uh, production output, I'm not quite sure how you even have time to sleep, but I am curious about what you might be able to tell us about anything that that anything else that we can have that we have to look forward to uh, coming from you. Uh, anything that you're working on that you can talk about? Now you mentioned something just a moment ago. Yeah, that, um, you, most of what I'm working on I can't talk about. But right. when they bought the violence, they bought two books. So I'm working on the second book for them, um, which is going to be a, a feminist horror story set at one of those kind of mountain resorts where, uh, you know, fancy people in the 1800s would go to take the healing waters. But really, they were kind of like locking women up and torturing them for being uppity. 
Oh. You know, one of those places that's like, you're going to go get some restful, you know, and then you're going to have a lobotomy. <laughs> um, so that's, that one is proving to be very fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Lobotomies at all. Okay. Well, uh, that sounds fascinating. And you said 2023, maybe? Maybe. Um, I also, I've sold um, a YA book. It's the only YA book. It's the only book I've ever written that like isn't violent. It's just kind of fun and magical. Um, it's called Midnight at Houdini. And it's about, it's a retelling of The Tempest set in a magical hotel in Las Vegas. Um, oh. So I'm not sure if that was 2023 or 2024, but it's it's sold and uh, and I'll be working on that later this year too. And then of course we'll have the third Minecraft book, um, which is not written or ideated yet, but will happen one day. And amongst all these other things, and when you get to maybe sleep, gotcha. Okay, I sleep. I, I sleep at night like a normal person at midnight. <laughs> Okay, I'll take your word for it. I, I'll take your word for it. Um, now, at this point, I would like to warn everyone that we are going to now be talking at great, well, in in depth about the violence, and so there will be spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. So if you have not, if you have not read the book then uh you but if you Put have your fingers in your ears and go la, la 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 that's right that's correct um if you're if you're planning to then i will definitely be spoiling everything for you if you continue to listen so you are you have been forewarned twice so okay the first thing i want to mention about this book is the incredible suspense level i mean to tell you i <laughs> I, you know, I, I just, I found it hard to put it down to have to go do anything else. And Excellent. one night, it's yes, it's exactly right. And one, one night, um, occasionally I have trouble going to sleep and there was this one. And so typically what I do is if I can't go to sleep, I stay up late. When I go to bed, I usually go to sleep fairly quickly, but if I can't, then I'll get back up and read for a while. Uh huh. Well, that was really smart because I was I picked this up and I was like, oh, my. And, you know, so I'm looking at it's like four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I think maybe I need to try to go to sleep again. But I always try to like I try to end the chapters on some on like a cliffhanger or something vaguely uncomfortable that'll make you want to turn the page. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Mean mean yes. And and you and you did. Um, and the, the thing that that I that, that I, the way I felt about it, and this coming from me is high praise, uh, is that I honestly never knew what to expect next. I did not know. That was the goal. And, you know, it was, to me, that's really important. I don't like to be able to figure things out ahead of time. Um, and, you know, whether we're talking about events or we're talking about people, uh, you know, you, and you've, You've always had some kind of, you know, some elements of mystery and suspense in most of your work, but I think you really ramped it up for this one. And so you get like, if I had four thumbs, you'd get them. But I don't <laughs> have two, so, um, and one of my my question for you in regard to this though is, do you think that having the alternating points of view maybe made that, you know, the kind of helped in that process? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the idea is that, you know, you don't get that immediate relief. Even if you do keep reading, you might have to go to full chapters to figure out right. what happened to the last point of view. So it's, it's kind of cruel. But, you know, when I first I sold this is my first book I've ever sold on spec. So instead of writing a complete book and giving it to my agent to sell, I wrote 20,000 words and uh, an outline. And that's what we sold it on. And when that happened, I was planning on like 11 points of view. So many of these characters were I mean, you know, there was. Um, it wasn't just the the three main characters here. It was also the husband and, you know, the person who made the virus and the person with the motorhome and, you know, Big Fred and like pretty much every little person here had had a part. And then my editor and her infinite wisdom, Sarah Pede, amazing, was like, what if we really focus down on just these three women? And I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Right. So by right. the book, you can have whatever points of view you want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're like, I think I can manage that. Yeah. yeah. 
Now, I what strikes me about uh, the violence itself, the the disease, if you will, is it is it's kind of a throwback plague, and by that I mean it's something that's you know carried and passed by. Uh, you know, an animal, insect, uh, whatever uh, the case may be. And given that you were writing it during a very different type of pandemic, uh, did you do you feel as though that approach, the, the one that you chose for the book, did it make it a little easier to do during what you were having to live through at the same time? Oh, no, it made it so much harder because I sold this book before COVID existed. I sold this book in like December or January um, before COVID hit. So, you know, back then it was just baby town frolics and me thinking of what it might be like if there was if there was uh, going to be a plague because I'd never lived through one. Um, and then when I came time to write, you know, take that 20,000 words I had and jump half of it and then write the other 140,000 words, it was during that first wave of the pandemic. Um, we were kind of hopeful and we thought that we would beat it and we were still cheering for the doctors and moms were sewing masks and families were staying home and riding their bikes down the middle of the street because nobody was driving. And it was like, yay, hopeful. And then by the time I got to my second revision, so where I finished the book, sent it to my editor, all the people at you know Delray gave in their thoughts and I got it back to revise it. We were to the point of the pandemic where I was like, people are selfish jerks and this is never going to end. <laughs> Right, right. It's never so going to It added to the trouble because I had to like keep keep revising it to keep in line with with our actual reaction to the pandemic versus what I a uh, do good or fool thought would actually happen. Okay, I, I I can I can see why that would have been uh, more of a challenge. Now, something else that. I found very interesting is that people, the, the characters in the in the story uh, that had violent or abusive tendencies, were not the ones who got afflicted with the disease. And uh, as a reader, it it kind of seems to me that at least part of your reason reason for doing that was to be able to give the abused um, the power to fight back. And, you know, am I, am I like way off base with this? Um, no, that's, well, that's where the idea about. came from. Um, I grew up with the violence that is pictured in, in the, kind of the opening chapters right. of this book. That was very much based on the house that I grew up in. Um, and the whole point of it was it made you feel powerless. There's a scene where Chelsea is talking about, you know, that there was a stool that was on the floor and her husband would make her sit on it while he, you know, yell, yelled at her, basically, and abused her. And that was that was a stool that existed in my house that I knew that if my dad told me to sit on the stool, that it was going to be a really bad night. Um, okay. And the whole point of that was that you were powerless. You couldn't fight back. They were bigger than you physically and more dangerous. You couldn't fight back physically. And we know now that if a woman shoots or stabs her, her spouse for abusing her, she's going to go to jail. Um, very few women get off just scot-free for that. And the ones that do are typically very wealthy and white. Um, so, you know, the idea came to me that if there had just been a way to fight back legally, like if, if if you could fight back and know that you couldn't end up in jail for doing something that, uh, you know, deserves to be done, that that would be really cool. <laughs> and so I started thinking about like, okay, well, you know, if you get a disease, it's not your fault. If you, you know, if you have malaria, that's not your fault. If you, whatever you have is not your fault. So it's like, okay, well, if we had a disease that made you kill someone, they can't really like put you in jail because you weren't there. You weren't doing it on purpose. Um, so it uh, it offers lots of interesting ways to um, to fight back when you have traditionally been more helpless. Yeah. Well, and it was, uh, yes, those, those opening chapters are very unnerving. Um, so I, I, I know that that had to be a difficult, a difficult thing. And yet, um, yeah, there's a there's an author's note if you're thinking about picking up the book. Um, it does include um, violence against animals and against women, um, right. but it's not gratuitous. Um, right. It is grounded in reality. It informs the characters, and in the end, you will feel satisfied with how things turned out. I believe. Yeah, no, and I I will agree with that. It's not um, overly, you know, it's it's not to the point where where. Uh, people would 
turn away. You know, I, I mean, I don't think so. I don't think most people would. I it's think. hard to read, but I think that, um, you know, a lot of books are that are worth reading still. That's right. You know, this I, I would never tell someone that this is like a good popcorn read or an escape read. Um, but right, it, that's it right. be. I have books for that. They have vampires with nipples on the cover. That's a very different book. <laughs> Right, right. And um, yeah, I think I still have that picture over here in a notebook. Uh, but I, I do. I actually do. But you you were also, when you were talking to Stephen Graham Jones the other night, you were talking about the cover color yeah. and about how if people, ha if it was a different color, people might get the wrong impression of what was in the book. Yeah, they did briefly talk about making the color, the cover of the violence, which you can see it is blood red yeah but they talked about making it kind of this cornflower blue that looked like my grandmother's powder room um <laughs> kind of to make it more palatable to kind of like your book club and your women's fictions reader and i was like well i think that's really misleading and i think that when they get to some of these violent scenes they're gonna be like this is not a cornflower blue book sir this is yeah exactly no you know, I, don't, I don't want the reader to feel betrayed you know when you go and expecting a different book than what it is now yeah there's the Oh, yeah, there's my old vampire covers. Yep. Yeah. There. Back you want know, popcorn fun. You can go read about criminy stain and and the steampunk terrain. That's yeah. And he he's uh and even in that series though, there are some things that it's it's not it's not I can't all write a book without without issues. Like I, I can't do it. So there's right. There's well, always some I, issues. But yeah, in, in that book, the the woman was she had just left an abusive husband. So yeah, it's it's my lived experience. I've never, I, I've never really not been harassed. So it's in there. It's in the DNA. Now, except for the one brief chapter, and we talked about this earlier when you were saying that you initially had all of these, um, you know, different points of view that you were working with initially, uh, that, but in, in the book itself, you do have just the, the three main characters, except for that one chapter told from, uh, you know, from David's point of view, which was very interesting, because I, I remember when I started that, I thought, oh, dear God, <laughs> you know, what's going to happen now? Here comes and, trouble. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, um, and that's, and it is very short, um, but you did have the, you know, the three main, uh, the three main characters uh, that, tell the story. And my question for you is, which one of them was the most difficult to write and which one was the easiest? Uh, I don't think any of them were were particularly difficult or easy. You know, there were just three very different people, which, you know, I've, I've been the teenager now and I am the mother. Um, unfortunately, you know, I, I as, a, as a teen, as a child, I was in a domestic abuse situation. I am not as an adult thank God, but I definitely witnessed it a lot. Um, right. And then of course I, I haven't been the grandmother yet. Um, but I guess the, the biggest challenge was that, um, you know, when, when writers write a lot of books, you get to where you don't want to do the same thing. You don't want to, you know, go over old ground. You, you kind of always want to challenge yourself and uh, keep on top of your game. And with Patricia, I wanted to take a character that I couldn't stand and turn them into someone that I loved. And I wanted the reader to feel that way too. Um, she was based on when I was uh, the summer between junior and senior year, I went on a summer to France and stayed with a family in France and the chaperones to that trip, there was a very nice woman and then her mother, Patrice. And I hated Patrice enough that like she featured broadly in my travel diaries from that time, all the awful things that Patrice did and said. And I was like, okay, what would make me like Patrice? Right. right. <laughs> so I turned her into Patricia. And uh, did my damnedest to make you hate her, and then, if not love her, at least understand her, or appreciate her. So that was more like it wasn't like a oh this is really hard. It was like I don't know if I can do this, but I'm going to try. Well, you did. You you did it very effectively because I I remember thinking, you know, in the beginning, uh, and well, in any of the situations where she's dealing with her family, and when when they're getting ready to leave, when she and Randall are supposedly packing up and she's saying, you know, uh, I forget, I, I can't remember exactly what, where they were going. I don't remember if Iceland. it was- Iceland, they were going to Iceland, the icy well, Iceland. Yeah, but I'm, I'm trying, I was thinking that it maybe they went somewhere else before that. Oh, yeah, they went to Denver were, beforehand. Okay, okay. So she was, and she was saying, um, 
you know, she's thinking to herself, well, I've got this and this and I've taken care of that and that. And I just can't think of one other thing I'm forgetting. And I, you know, you just want to shake her. Uh, I mean, your family. Exactly. And I was like, what is wrong with you? You, you know, uh, there, there were lots of things I was thinking in my brain. Um, and I, you know, I, because I had her pegged as the monster uh, you know, who, uh, I mean, not as monstrous as a, a couple of the other characters, but, um, that, that, you know, just because of the way that she treated her daughter and the way that she treated her, her granddaughters. But then, it, you know, chapter 44, when Patricia realizes what she's done and what she's given up at this point, um, you know, uh, Chelsea's already gone, um, and uh, and Ella is not there because she uh, got locked out, not really by mistake, but just kind of, it was an oversight on Patricia's part, I think, that she she wasn't thinking it through. She, yeah, was she, wasn't, she just wasn't thinking about her at all. Right. So, so she ends up taking the care of the five-year-old granddaughter, and I think that whole segment when the girl, when the girls first show up at her house um, and how awful she is to them and just not just in her manner, but in the thoughts that she's having, it just really bothered me as being a grandmother myself. And there's kind of this feeling that a lot of grandparents have that, that you think, okay, well, I may have screwed things up when I was a parent, but I have a chance to kind of do things right as a grandparent. And it's like, no, lady, you are doing everything wrong. Yeah. That chapter 44 was, I mean, she, you can see little bits of her beginning to change prior to that, but it's in that chapter that she comes to this realization of herself and uh, there's this one line where she's looking at Brooklyn, the the five-year-old granddaughter, and she said she stares at this tiny, glowing, golden bean as if for the first time. And I thought, okay, now she gets it. Now she gets it. And, you know, it really, it seemed to me as though there were, she went through more of a change in her kind of, um, I guess, her outlook and her perspective more than the other two did. Now, Chelsea's was a different story. Hers, she did, of course. Yeah. But uh, but I, I just wanted to... Well, Chelsea's was and, more finding her old self and finding her power, and Patricia's more, right. you know, erasing 40 years of damage. Right. So it, she just had to go further than anyone else. Right. So it took a while, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, just the idea that... Um, you know, and it was interesting that in prior to um, this chapter 44 realization stuff going on, that um, when the girls show up and she just automatically says, well, of course, you know, they'll stay with me. Uh, so she had a little bit of that. You know, there was this little inkling of uh, this kind of protectiveness that, that you expect a, a parent or a grandparent to have. Uh, but they definitely had a very fraught relationship, she and her own daughter. So uh, anyway, I I just wanted to share some of that. And just to tell you that, um, you know, for me, I thought that uh, her whole change uh, was was just remarkable. And um, I, I think you outdid yourself in that one. <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, you, you honestly did. So um, I... And I, and I really appreciated that as, you know, as a reader to, to be able to go from, as you said, severely disliking someone uh, to, to thinking, oh, well, they're probably, you know, they're probably my favorite character at this point. Well, except for little Brooklyn, because she's just darling. But um, she's what, the baby Yoda. There you, that's right. Um, so did you end up having a favorite character? Uh, from the book? Um, I mean, it's, 
you know, uh, it's funny, like when you write a, an urban fantasy or a weird Western or kind of a an escape world that people are kind of reading to fall into the world and escape into, I tend to have favorite characters there. Um, in this one, these people were kind of almost real and non-fictional in such a way that, you know, it's like there are three people over there that you know. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, right. I don't I didn't I didn't get attached to them the way that I did like Crimney Stain or Nettie Lonesome or um, you know, kind of some of those those people from from past books who were, you know, these kind of idealized heroes saying quippy right. things and doing, you know, exciting adventures. It was more like uh and when I tried to make Chelsea, I tried to make a woman very, very different from me. Um and and a woman that you would see and you know pity and that it's almost like she's not a person without a personality because it's been stolen from her. Um, so we were very different. And then I, I liked Ella, but you know she also what none of these people were like me. I, I was always super weird, and all of these people want to be very normal. So I was trying purposely to write people that were different from me. Um, I I really liked uh, River and Leanne. They were originally mm -hmm. point of view characters. Um, but I, I loved writing, you know, a, a gorilla epidemiologist and a, uh, you know, TikTok uh, orphan kitten raiser with an RV, like going around the yes. country, giving the finger to pharma bros. Like they show up next to the taco truck at the university and you're just like, we're going to take your blood, give you two Oreos and then shoot you full of, you know, vaccine. Like I, I just, I really like that concept. And you know, pure good souls. Like sometimes when things are going really, really badly for you, which it, it does for Ella, everything goes wrong for Ella. Yeah. You forget that there are good people in the world that will help you um, and not expect anything in return for it. Um, I don't know. When I, when I was about her age and things went really bad with my home life, I remember um, being really upset because my mom and I had to leave our house and go into hiding. And um, my AP calculus teacher had given everybody one of those really fancy, expensive graphing calculators. And mine was at home. And I was super embarrassed because I got really good grades. And I was like, in school, I was a very perfect little do good child. And I couldn't do my homework because I didn't have my calculator. And it was also, you know, a $250 object that wasn't there. And I had to go to my AP math teacher and be like, look, I'm really sorry. You know, this is what's happening to me. My, you know, calculus is at home with my dad. And I, I can't go there because he's going to kill me. And like, she was so kind and gentle and sweet. And like, I'd never had a connection with her. She wasn't one of those teachers I was real buddy buddy with. And she was very stern and I was very scared. And she was so good to me. And she gave me another calculator <laughs> and she was like, wow. don't worry about it. You know, like, I don't care. And it was just that thought of like, I, I would never have thought that she was gonna be a big ally during that time. You know, I thought she was gonna be really mad at me and make me bring her a check for $200. So there are these people that you don't expect that kind of show up like little sunbeams and make you realize that, you know, there's there's still good people out there. Right, and that's definitely what River and Leanne were like for uh, for Ella because she wasn't expecting, and that that whole scene where she she's like, the, she thinks it's the, like the murder van kind of idea, you know? Yeah, you see um, a Walter White van out in the CVS parking lot and they're like, come on inside. <laughs> yeah. We'll put your soup yeah. in the microwave. Like, yeah, no, it's, that's very threatening when you go through what she's been through. Right. And I mean, given other situations, I mean, and, you know, when you're reading that section, it's like you want to err on the side of that or not err, but you want to you want to be on the side of the of the people who really are good. You want to you want to believe that that's what they're there for. But there's always that little you know, that little suspicion that, well, you know, given the way things are going and given what's going on in this book and, you yeah. know, what's going on, uh, you know, just what the background is. So it was yeah, really I, fun I, in that scene when you realize that, like, the setup you would have to have in an RV to make a vaccine like this just looks like a murder room that Patrick exactly. Bates set up. <laughs> it just naturally looks like you're going to die in there. That was super helpful. Exactly. Yeah. And she even, I think Leanne even says at one point that, well, I could take the plastic down, but the thing is, it's there to keep everything clean. And I yeah. know it's making you nervous and, and all of that. But uh, yeah, they were great characters. And then uh, the other thing that uh, I was very curious about was the idea of the, of the VFR and uh, the, you know, the, connections to pro wrestling and all of that uh was that always part of your part of your plan or did this kind of generate as you were coming up with your you know the, the framework of the story it was so when i was kind of 
building out the, the outline for this, coming, coming up with the idea for it, um, I was at ALA in Washington, D.C., and I had some spare time and I was like, I was trying to figure this out and I just couldn't get to where I was like, I don't, I need that meat of the story. You know, I need Chelsea to go do something. And I was like, maybe she could like go up north and work at a hotel, like a Twin Peaksy situation, you know, <laughs> maybe she could like work at a diner. And I was like, that's all so boring though. Like, I don't want to write like my adventure in the hotel where, you know, obviously the male manager is going to sexually harass her. And, you know, it just got kind of boring. Um, and so I, I didn't know what to do. So I went to do a salt tank float where you go into sensory deprivation, you go into this glowing salt water filled orb without of your clothes on and you lay there like precog just in the complete darkness, weightless. And um, I kind of used that to try to figure out the story and try to figure out, okay, what's the the craziest thing I could do that would work. And, you know, my mind's going through all of these little you know, tree branching ideas. And it just got around to trying to figure out like, what is something that this world would need? And because of that time during, during, you know, the original COVID or whatever. Um, yeah, I guess it actually, whenever it was, I just remember thinking like my husband and son were supposed to go see uh, like a big wrestling thing in Tampa when we lived there and it got canceled and they lost a ton of money and they were so upset and they were like, okay, when is, when is wrestling going to come back? Like we want to see wrestling and probably the people in the audience of wrestling don't really care if they get COVID or not. And I was like, oh, wrestling. Oh. <laughs> you know, anything about glow, you know, there was like a glow aspect to it. But you're like, okay, if you can't run professional wrestling, what if you started like the underground kind of fight club of the same idea of oh we have the violence now we're gonna fight so it does it just seemed like the an interesting place to take the story and to have someone like chelsea be like that's the last thing you think that this you know exactly. this woman who cares about shiplap and essential oils is going to end up doing yeah yeah and that i mean that was it was a very uh a very cool addition and it, it does as you said it's like the it's the kind of the least likely place you would expect someone like her to go. So, uh, you know, they probably would not have ever occurred to her. So, yeah. Now, one thing I do want to mention, and I've got it um, pulled up here, you got a very nice review from the New York Times. The New York Times book review. Yeah, and uh, this was this was great. Uh, and the comment that uh, was so cool is that they. In, in the review, it says the virus intersects in shocking, transformative ways with the casually accumulated and painfully subl sublimated violence of their daily lives. What could have been a flimsy allegory is instead a carefully and surprisingly angled mirror. And that's that's pretty awesome. And, you know, that um, hopefully someone will give you that, uh, you know, laminated, you need to have... <laughs> Poster. I actually probably uh, should do that. You're right. Yeah, I mean that's like a paper copy. Yeah, I mean it, that's an awesome, uh, you know, description of of how the book can work. And I, it strikes me too. I think that it's it's the type of book that will mean something different to just about anybody who reads it. You know, for for whatever reason, whether you just want a cracking good story that is going to uh, you know, be a real page turner and with characters that just kind of uh, leap off the page and either bang you in the head or jump into your heart either way. Uh, you you know, chair. Yeah, you know, you can you can enjoy that. Um, and then certainly there are the um, the other issues and, you know, um, and it's it's just it's it's fabulous. I, I can't say enough good about it and i i just think it's wonderful uh and i do i have one more question and that is that did you know from the beginning how it was going to end or did that kind of transpire along the way as well i i knew how that that scene was going to converge i knew that that was what had to happen um, but the murder weapon was definitely another case of like, what is the dumbest thing? <laughs> What's right, the dumbest right. thing I could use as a murder weapon that would just really like, if you found the person who died in wherever they ended up and were like, Hey, what's the dumbest, what's the most embarrassing thing you could have been killed with? 
<laughs> and that's, that's how that came about. Yeah. Okay. Just the words fun to say, but yeah, that was. Yeah. Just okay. gotta go for the. It, it opens with somebody getting killed with Thousand Island dressing, so I had to top that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That was. That I, I was kind of like, okay, uh, out of all the things that it could have been, I went, well, I guess so. What's the uh, dumbest thing I could kill someone with? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a wonderful book. Uh, many congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I, I've known you for a long time, and uh, the and I've always enjoyed everything that you've written. Uh, but this book is, um, you know, it's absolutely amazing, and you deserve all the good New York oh, Times thank you, Carol. reviews. And uh, you know, from any anyone else that uh, that can do them, and and that's that's the way to uh, make authors happy. We all see that. Go leave a review uh, wherever. So, yeah, um, leave a review. Um, or asking your library to order a copy also really helps a lot. Um, asking your local indie bookstore to get you a copy helps a lot. Uh, I, even just adding it on Goodreads helps a lot. It, there's so many little ways to help authors that don't oh, necessarily okay. have to cost you full price. Right. I that's I had forgotten about that. That if it if it shows up as being of interest on Goodreads. Um, Shoot, I've probably got a lot of people I've helped out if if they if they take Amazon wish list into consideration. But <laughs> anyway, um, but I, it, it is it's fabulous. I recommend it uh, to anyone, to anyone and everyone. It it needs to be it needs to be read. So oh, and if, if you're a person who really likes signed copies of books. Um, Mysterious Galaxy has uh, books with signed book plates in them. I'm also willing to personalize those. So if you want like your name in it or something, uh, you can get a signed personalized book plate if you buy through them. And then Eagle Eye Books in Decatur, Georgia, quite near me, they have some hand signed ones from the, the book launch. Um, so yeah, if you're into that, we can get you, we can get you signed copies. There you go. Yes. Cause those are and the Eagle Eye ones also have little knife bookmarks in them. Cause they have these beautiful little bookmarks shaped like the butcher knife on the front of the book. Yes, the, the, they're and they're great. Uh, I got to tell you, when uh, when mine got here, uh, and I, I had the I had the little bookmark out, and the you know my husband saw the cover of the book and the bookmark, and he's like, but he he was kind of surprised because he's met you, and he's like he's like, but is she that scary to live with? And I was like, <laughs> yes, she's very frightening. It was so funny, but anyway, all of my books are violent. I can't, yeah. I don't know how to, except for Houdini, but everything else, even like somebody asked me about my Minecraft books recently. And I was like, well, I mean, they're whimsical, but Minecraft is about like these children in a world where like, they're constantly under attack by right. zombies yeah, yeah. And dead people and creepers and witches and crazy people with axes. Like Minecraft is, can you could write a horror book in the Minecraft world. Well, there you go. Now there's a there's an idea for another uh, trilogy, right? Well, Delilah, thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy day uh, to answer a bunch of my questions and to yeah. humor me. I appreciate it, um, and we appreciate everyone uh, who you know everyone who's been watching. If you uh, once you see this and you have any questions for Delilah, feel free to leave them in the comments section of the of the video and uh, I'll make sure that they make their way to her. So and hopefully we'll get to see each other at Dragon Con this year if if things are are chiller. I hope so. I hope so. We we can uh you know fingers crossed uh last year was a little was a little nerve-wracking for those I dropped out cuz they they said they weren't going to enforce the mask mandate so I had to drop out but hopefully this year it'll be a little different. Who, now, what was that? I'm sorry. The well, I was supposed to be a guest um, last year, and I liked that they required vaccination or a negative test. But then they said, we require you to wear masks, but we can't make you wear masks. We just expect you to do the right thing. And I was like, have you met people? Oh, that may have been just for guests. That wasn't for uh, attendees, because anybody who was there, I, I'm serious. I didn't see anybody without one. All I know, did. but the way that they phrased it was it didn't not sound right. So if okay. maybe people did do the right thing, but like the way that it was phrased, I wasn't comfortable. So hopefully this year, you know, and it, I, from what I hear, like nothing bad happened last no. year. Like it seemed like there weren't a lot of breakouts or anything. So 
Knock on wood for this year because I miss Dragon Con and I miss your snack table. Oh, there you go. Well, please come back. We would uh, we would love to have you. So anyway, thank you, Delilah. Thank you to all of our viewers. And uh, we will see you hopefully in person. Bye, yes. everyone. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>